This episode of Coffee Talks is brought to you by Markham LLP Accountants and Advisors. Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Coffee Talk. We have a very special one for you today. We have- Wait a minute. Where's the coffee? <laughs> with, with, with Marcus Limonis, who uh, is an entrepreneur, uh, educator, multiple TV shows, CNBC, HGTV, his most recent show, The Renovator, which I highly recommend you should, uh, check it out. It's not just about renovations. It's about how it psychologically affects people who are going through the renovation. And he gets a lot of great detail in there. Marcus, thank you so much for being here. I'm today. excited to be here. I'm like Let's a fan. This. I'm a fanboy. <laughs> thank you. I'm a fanboy. Are you a subscriber to The Real Deal? I am. I, you do take my money and oh. I'm happy to give it to you. Well, you know what? We should get you some coffee then. That's, That's right. Like the Absolutely. Least we can do. Thank you for being here. You got it. You mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of the businesses fail because they make bad real estate decisions. It's not, it's not the widget, it's not the product, it's not the restaurant. And you see a lot of restaurants that never reopen because they can't afford the new leases that the landlords are offering because the price of a steak hasn't gone up uh, you know, proportionally compared to their rents. Yeah. And how, how do you get around that and how, do you, how can you? Well, I think there's two issues, right? Th- there's, there's one issue that I can't solve for, which is landlords' perception of the value of their property and the cap rate that they're looking from a return standpoint, that you're not gonna change their mind. And you know, I'll have business owners say to me all the time, I don't understand why the guy won't just take the lease. The thing's been sitting empty for three years. And yeah. You have to explain to them, he may have a loan on the books, it may mess up his portfolio, he doesn't want to establish the lower value which is gonna affect the rest of his real estate. You can't get into that level of sophistication with somebody that's trying to open up a donut shop. Right. Okay. And the reason that a lot of places like donut shops, flower shops, restaurants, clothing boutiques, every business that we love to support, you love to support, all of us do, they usually fail. Now there's a handful of them that fail because they're not doing things right, but they usually fail because they picked a bad location, they signed up for something on the real estate side they can't afford, they didn't negotiate TI and they put all of their working capital into TI and then had no working capital to run their business. It runs the gamut. Yeah. And I'm, I, I think that if the real estate moguls of America wanted to enhance the value of their property, then they have to figure out a way to build a roadmap for businesses to understand how to be great tenants. Mm-hmm. And a landlord who's desperate to have a tenant has to say to somebody, I'm not gonna rent it to you, Right. and here's why. I think you're amazing, I think your business is a great idea, but I think you're in the wrong location. My friend Johnny is on the right street with the right neighborhood at the right price at the right time. As much as I need the cash flow, I know that I'm not doing you a service. You sort of see that happen with the bigger developers. Like when they build something and they're like, you know what, we only want grade A uh, tenants in this place. Like for example, in Hudson Yards, when they first launched it, there were certain retailers they didn't want in there. I think now they're, they're you know, they're more likely to take anyone. Yeah. But uh, in the beginning, they only wanted Cartier and Louis Vuitton and all this other stuff. And I feel like those people can't afford to do it because they're trying to create uh, like a, an environment and a community for those certain Those shops. landlords. Yeah. Well, they're trying to establish a premium. They, I, in my opinion, I think they believe that the premium nature of their tenants would yield the premium nature of their asset. Mm -hmm. It would sort of move in tangent, right? Right. And people would look at that if they ever wanted to flip that property and say to themselves, the book of tenants is so strong and their credit is so strong that it's an A, it's a Walgreens type, you know, four and a half, three and a half, four percent cap rate. They'll look at that and think that it's going to appreciate their property. Hudson Yards found out that Neiman Marcus had a great cachet and a really crappy balance sheet. Yeah. I forgot the detail of the balance sheet. They, they found out the hard way. Yeah. What's in there now? Uh, it's empty right now, but there's some, uh, there's, uh, you know, there, there's some ideas of uh, something that, could go, something there, that yeah. could go in there. But you saw Facebook spend a ton of money just pulling out of these leases. And there was so much invested because Facebook was coming here and they were using that lease to get other people to come here. And now Facebook is like, well, you know what? We don't need a million and a half square feet in Hudson Yards. And they, pu- they spend a fortune just to get out of those deals. Uh, you know, you deal with a lot of uh, businesses and uh, family-owned businesses just th- through this show and just through your interactions with other people who use you for coaching and education. Uh, succession is, uh, is, you know, is part of a lot of restaurants and a lot of the small businesses in the world. 
And in a lot of ways, real estate uh, families and real estate uh, uh, owners, uh, their family businesses at the end of the day, the portfolios right. get, you know, it's, it gets handed over and over. Um, how do you, how do you sort of, uh, what are some of the good succession plans that can be applied to real estate? And what are some of the pitfalls that you yeah. can see that? I mean, I, I, you know, I talk a lot about generational wealth and real estate is one of those segments and one of those sectors where generational wealth is very real. You can pass on these assets that appreciate over time and there may be dips and rises in the market, but over time, over a five, 10, 20 year horizon, those assets appreciate in value. I think too often a generational wealth, uh, people believe they can establish outside of real estate with some quick fix or some internet you know, bonanza or some other scheme. Real estate for me has always been a safe haven for anybody. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the family nature of real estate, uh, it's usually because it has been passed on from generation to generation. The wealthiest organizations and the wealthiest families in America typically have made their money off of real estate. Mm -hmm. They've plotted themselves down on a piece of land at one point in history. They've passed that on from generation and they understand it. I think the key is, from my perspective, because I've seen it go bad, is understanding the balance of recognize the value of that asset and understanding the cap or the restriction of extracting value from that asset. Mm -hmm. Reason I make that point is the pitfall question. Sometimes as it moves from generation to generation, and I'll use you as an example, your great grandchildren will be benefactors of any real estate investment you made today, God willing, that everybody between them and you doesn't muck it up. Mm -hmm. When that great grandchild acquires that property through whatever process it may be, he or she may have some silly idea to go start some other silly business and they may put a ton of debt on that business. Right. And understanding that generational wealth can be exploded, imploded through the construct of debt or through the construct of levering it up to the point where you can't handle it, that is the pitfall that I've seen more often than not. Right because they didn't work for it, because they didn't build it themselves, because they didn't deal with the hard times and the good times all in one generation, I see more family businesses take the liberties of passing it on to somebody without the formal knowledge, without the formal training, without the formal education, and these people are looking to start something, buy something, go to Rodeo Drive, move to Firefly Island, do something silly. Yeah and then real estate changes hands. It's funny you bring that up because I don't know if you know of uh, Sheldon Solo, but he was like one of the billionaire landlords of uh, New York City. And he died and left uh, the entire portfolio to his son, who is uh, this playboy and uh, who's like selling these iconic assets and, you know, starting uh, wind solar farms and, uh, you know, the marijuana businesses and things like that. But, and he's... The same stupid shit I just described. <laughs> yeah, we're just talking about. Now, we don't know if that stuff is going to hit or not, but it is a thing that obviously happens, especially because he was never in the business. He was never in the father's business. He was like living in a farm. But Amir, he, he would have to, he or she, whoever that person is, would have to sit down with a piece of paper and come to the concrete conclusion that the risk that they're going to take on by liquidating this generational asset is going to yield him more than the appreciation of that asset will over a period of time. Yeah. And he also has to be, um, um, I don't want to say this negatively, I guess um, um, aloof to the fact that the next generation is going to miss out. Yeah. And, and he has a major next generation. He has 23 kids. So it's, uh, he's got a lot of mouths to feed. Uh, but, um, you know, a lot of people don't know this about you because, you know, you're a host of uh, different TV programs. You invest in a lot of different businesses. Yeah. But what do, you, what do you exactly do? I, I also see you speaking at, like, at so many places and yeah. so many things. What do you do? What I do for a living? What do you do for a living? <laughs> yeah, most people don't know that. I, there's like there's like two sides of my life. Uh, there's the side that people know from whether it's working on small businesses on the profit or renovating homes on HGTV. Most people are like, oh, that's what he does for yeah. a living. But the guy seems to live pretty nice <laughs> for a guy that has a television show. Right, right. The entertainment business has not been a, uh, no pun intended, has not been a profit center for me. Yeah. Uh, my primary business, I'm actually in the home business except the kind of businesses, uh, the kind of homes that I'm in move. So uh, my business, Camping World, 
sells one out of almost every four RVs in America. And most people are stunned to know that for 20 years, that's what I've done. Yeah. That, has, that blessing of that business and America's love of exploring land in this country and staying on the beach and the, in, the, in the mountains, wherever it may be, has really been the blessing that's given me the ability to go out and do stuff. And that business boomed, in the, during, especially during the pandemic. I remember reading yeah. all the stuff about the RV business. It boomed, it boomed during the pandemic, but I think the, the misnomer in that is that it wasn't good before then. Mm -hmm. And the RV business has been out there for 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah. And there's you know about 11 or 12 million RVs in circulation today. What changed during COVID was that people looked at the RV business with less of a, a stink eye. Uh, I remember when I first got in it, people were like, oh, that's for, you know, people like in Alabama and those are for farmers and for country music and for race car drivers. And the reality of it is, is that people in New York City, when I took the company public in 2016, I would sit with, you know, major potential investors and they they just weren't familiar with the concept. Yeah. I was trying to educate them about like, it's a box, it's on wheels, it drives around, it parks in this real estate, it called the campground. Today... Everybody, it's kind of like nouveau, hip. Yeah. And if you uh, ask any of your spouses who really make all the decisions in our house, where should we take the kids? They're like, let's take them camping. Yeah. Put their phones down, put their video games down, and get out and see uh, the land in this and country. And how did you go from having that RV business to helping people run their restaurants properly? Uh, it's a, it's a, I'll give you the smallest version that I can. So I, I, I um, was adopted from an, uh, uh, an orphanage in Beirut, Lebanon. And I moved uh, to Miami when I was nine months old. And my family had a car business. Mm -hmm. My, uh, my uh, extended family had a car business. So I grew up in that business. And I was always a bit of a troubled kid. I wasn't that successful as a kid. I was a terrible student. And growing up in Miami, there's a lot of distractions. I decided to go off to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I go to school. I get an education. It's an average education. Uh, I, I wasn't a great student. When I got back into the business... I decided that I wanted to leave my family's business and I went to work for an amazing company called AutoNation. Mm -hmm. They're a consolidator of auto dealerships around the country. And it was founded by a gentleman by the name of Wayne Heisinga, who a lot of people know for blockbuster waste management, a lot of things. I started buying up family businesses and I myself had a family business in our own car dealership. And I learned the pitfalls, um, the pluses and the minuses of being in a family business. And over the years, I've always been a student of everything that everybody does. Like when I come to your office here, I'm asking you questions about everything you can imagine. Right. And I soak it all in. I can go to a, a, a really great you know, vegetarian restaurant and I'll ask them a million questions about their sourcing and about their pricing. And, and if you and I went out, you would kind of chuckle to yourself because I love to sort of say to people, if you move that over here just a little bit, it would be better. <laughs> uh, over time, people used to say to me, look, you're already handing out money like you're drunk to people that need help because you like to do good things for other people and you have a big mouth and you have an opinion about business. So why don't you just like do it? Right. Do it on television. But look, a lot of people want to go on television and give advice. They don't necessarily get multiple shows. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, being on television is, is part luck, but mostly hard work. Mm -hmm. It's not as glamorous as it seems. And when I would make an episode of, let's say I made 110 episodes of The Prophet. Oh, wow. Over a decade. For CNBC. Uh-huh. Over one decade. Yeah. Uh, I would spend on average in a given year, if I would make, let's say I would make 16 episodes in a given year, I would spend 200 days a year filming. Mm -hmm. 200. Not for four hours a day. And you had your business. And I had my business on the side. Yeah. So it came with a lot of, a lot of sacrifice. It's not, it was never a reality show. It wasn't scripted. There wasn't people out doing these things. And the proof of that is that I've been sued by a lot of people. I've sued people. It's, yeah. it's been very contentious. Um, but I stay committed to it. I, I invested over, uh, in the whole run, I invested over $70 million. $70 million Seven of your zero. own money. My own money. Yeah. And lost a lot of it. In, in investing in the businesses yeah. at, in, during the profit. Investing in the businesses from the show. And so the show or the network doesn't give you, do they give you any sort of uh, credit or any sort of monies to be able to 
uh, use or you use entirely your own money? Uh, so they, they fund, they were grateful. Uh, I was grateful to them for funding the production of the show. <laughs> And I was grateful for them to give me a wonderful platform. Yeah. Right. Their network is worth a time is worth a lot of money. Yeah. So they, they put their hard earned money in the production of the show, which is very expensive. You know, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to make an episode. Wow. And then they take time and, and they take their time slot and dedicate it to you. And so that was their contribution. I know most people, when I say that to them, they're like, that seems a little imbalanced. Yeah. And my response is, listen, um, I, when I was a little boy, told people that I wanted to be a teacher yeah. and I wanted to be an educator. And how lucky could one person be to be able to be a teacher and be an educator and do it on television? Right. Yeah. Like how much luckier can someone get? But uh, did, you, um, did you ever feel like, uh, would you ever have a future where TV and having a show is not a part of it? Because I feel like it's become such a part of you. I mean, yeah. are you spending more days out of the year on your TV show, even though that's making you lose money? Yeah. I mean, your other business must be incredible. Well, my, I, I more recently, particularly since COVID started, I flipped that script. And I'm spending 300 days a year on my business and 60 days, a year, 65 days a year, 64 because Christmas is closed, yeah. 64 days a year making television. And I got better at it over time. I got better with time management. I got better. And I started saying no more to yeah. things. I don't see a universe. Let me back up. With the way that content is being distributed today. Yeah. And I want to explore this even with you. Between the networks that we know today, cable that we know today, streaming services that we know today, there's also this new concept called fast channels which a lot of people are not familiar with. Mm -hmm. You can go on to your, if you've cut the cord, you can go onto a web-based thing and you can see Pluto and Freevee and all these things. Over time, people like yourself are going to learn to distribute your content yourself. Mm -hmm. the, number one, uh, the number one network in America, in the world, for communicating and disseminating video information is what? YouTube. You got it. Yeah. And so over time, whether it's Twitter, and I, I'm working hard to have the first television show broadcast on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. That's a goal of mine. Or whether it's in YouTube. I think that the walls are coming down for people to have the ability to have their own show. The walls are coming down. Now, is, are the big leagues, the NBCs and the Netflixes and the you know, history channels of the world? Of course. Mm -hmm. But there's limited real estate. But who, like, I thought about that too. But who, you know, one of the good things about the studios is that they vet the programming, right? So not everybody gets to say, hey, this is a show. There's a vetting process that happens and says, look, this has gone through our vetting process. We're experts at this. This person is the proper actor. This person is the proper presenter. We know this is going to be good and we're gonna put the production behind it to support it. But now with everybody being able to set up their cameras and putting out content, how do you field all that garbage and find like the good stuff? Well, the consumer is the ultimate vetter. And I always have to tell networks that in the most polite way. Ultimately, if the consumer eats it yeah. and comes back for more, that's the vetting that matters. The folks, the executives at the networks are put in a very tough predicament where they have to use their best judgment. Mm -hmm. And they have to understand, like you do in your business, right? You're not out writing articles about transactions that are not real estate based. Mm -hmm. You don't care if somebody bought a coffee chain of coffee shops. That's not typically who you are unless there's a real estate mm -hmm. weaved into it. The networks know who they want to be. They know the kind of programming they want to bring to the table. You may have an idea that doesn't fit anywhere, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make the idea a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And so I still encourage people to come up with creative ways to disseminate their information in more platforms that exist today. Right. I don't need a network um, telling Johnny, who's 17 years old, who has an amazing idea and his personality is bigger and brighter than both of us combined, that he won't have a shot because we don't hire 17 year olds. Right. Well, for us, you know, we always thought that uh, the more niche you can be, the bigger you can actually grow in this new world, right? Because if everybody can come to you and they know that it's going to be real estate, then you can just draw that real estate uh, audience. Where like if you're a general audience, I feel like those people have it the worst because they have to do all these different topics from uh, policy to technology to all this other stuff that's, you know. So I want to give you 
You remember I told you we go out to restaurants and I, we, I would try to fix stuff? The one thing that I would encourage the real deal to, to think about, because I'm a huge fan, I'm, I post on all your stuff, I like to poke at people, is to create earlier adopters. Mm-hmm. It, that ultimately, if you thought about the funnel of, of consumers, you have to bring them in somewhere. And, and, and the, the level of integrity and the level of sophistication that I believe you create from a content standpoint can actually take a step back and start at an earlier level. Mm-hmm. Young high school kids and young college kids and right out of college people who are fascinated by real estate, but don't possess the vernacular or necessarily the math sophistication yet, need a home where they can learn the ABCs and the one, two, threes. Mm-hmm. And if there was a way for you to create a, a small segment where how to sign a lease, how to buy a piece of property, right. how to do these things, you can bring early adopters in. Yeah. The other thing that I thought about, Amir, is I'm a hub and spoke guy. And I want to explain that to you. At the hub of what you do is real estate. The transactions, the appreciation, the glamour of it all, the money porn of it all. Mm-hmm. $59 million, $180 million, people love it. Mm-hmm. Off of that are the spokes that um, essentially create tangents off that real estate. And rather than thinking about the tangents off of it, think about the outer wheel and not the hub. And the outer wheel is the entire population of people. Mm -hmm. And rather than thinking about those hubs going from the inward out, think about them going from the outward in. Mm -hmm. What are the different entry points that are going to make your hub bigger? Mm -hmm. And so when I look through the magazine and I look through your site and I look through your social and I tend to be a bit of a stalker for all the stuff you guys do because I love it, I would love to see more stuff that gives me an easy way in Mm -hmm. that I could send to a college class that I may have a relationship with or high school kids that want to study real estate to say, this is my way into the real deal. Right. That's great. Just think about that a little bit. You know, I was, we just launched in Texas and I spent a month in Dallas, which I wouldn't recommend, but uh, (laughs) in July, I wouldn't recommend in July, but uh, you know, Dallas is completely divided in half. There's this, right below Route 30. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No, it's totally, South Dallas. Yeah. It's totally abandoned, you yeah. know? And uh, one of the things that I was talking to some of the people there was that you, you're not going to be able to support these guys because they only generate, it's half of the city and they only generate 15% of the tax revenue for the city. And, they're, and you have to educate these folks to make for themselves and create for themselves. And I thought a good part of that would be the real estate because that's stuff that they actually own and they could do stuff with it. But they wouldn't really, other than predatory lenders, nobody else is operating in those markets. You don't have the Wells Fargo's and the you know the J.P. Morgan's saying like, "Hey, this is how you can uh, refinance and reuse the money to like you know." Is that because they don't believe the cash flow coverage is there? They, yeah, they feel like it's not a good, you know, it's not a good loan basically. Right. So that's uh, that's so the loan to value is a challenge. The debt to income ratio is a challenge, and the cash flow coverage is a challenge. And the problem is, how does that cycle ever break? Well, you have to get the city involved because the city has a lot to gain from it. And if the city could take a lot of the responsibility that the banks don't want to take, but the banks can't process, I think that would help a lot. And I think Dallas has the potential to do that. But I think that's one of those great areas where you go and educate people on the stuff that they already hold. They just don't know what to do with it. Right. So you have these people who are going there and say, hey, I can give you a loan, but it's going to be at 20 percent. And, you know, those predatory lenders who go there to loan to own the properties eventually. So let me challenge that a little bit, sure. if I may. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a little town uh, in the middle of Kansas about seven or eight years ago that I became familiar with. I mean, when I tell you this town was small, it was one one main street. The town was called Horton, Kansas. And I was on my Facebook page one day and I saw this article about this military veteran who was potentially going to go to jail because he had not complied with the city's request request to tuck point the bricks on his building and that the building was becoming a problem for the town and for the community. And they were going to fine him and they were going to put him in jail. And the guy was like 80 something years old and he was a veteran. And I was like, okay, this is ridiculous. So I commented on the post and I said, 
how much is this fine? I'll pay the fine. And how much is the tuck pointing cost? Like, leave the guy alone. Right. And so the mayor reached out and said, on Facebook and said, if you come to our town and you spend a day with us, we'll, we'll, we'll not put this guy in jail. <sighs> Some equivalent of that, yeah. right? So I went to the town and, um, and it, was, it was struggling. They were struggling with sort of the general macroeconomics of it all. They were struggling with how to uh, see their real estate differently. They were struggling with Main Street. And I was very, very um, harsh with them. Mm -hmm. I required them to bring everybody from the town to the local high school and to the gymnasium. All 512 people that lived in the town. And I said, it's a town hall meeting. I'm not your mayor. I don't live here. I want to see everybody in the building. Yeah. And I said to them, I'm willing to make a commitment. I'm willing to buy buildings on this street. I'm willing to loan money. I'm willing to provide grants. I'm willing to give you guys the chance to take your town and your street and move it forward. But I have a condition. The town looks like shit. There's garbage everywhere. There's weeds on the sidewalks. Their curbs aren't painted. Your storefronts look like they're... And, it, and you, if you want me to invest in you, I need you to invest in you first. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving you one month, one month to clean your city up. Yeah. And I expect everybody in this gymnasium to participate. I want to see the high school kids out there painting the curbs. I want to see the lights fixed. I want to see everything sanded down. We're going to bring this back to life. And if it happens, I'll come back and I'll start buying buildings. Yeah. Did it happen? It happened. And it happened in the most magical way. Really? And the reason that I tell you that story, and I ended up buying a bunch of buildings there and I ended up donating them back. Yeah. My point was that in these small communities that you're referring to, in any town, in any city in America, if there is a neighborhood where real estate in the neighborhood has seen hard days, the only way that that, in my opinion, is going to change is if people pull out their soap, yeah. pull out their brush, pull out their weed eater, and clean it up. Because I can't invest in you if you don't invest right. in yourself. I'm not expecting you to build the building. You have limited funds. I respect that. Right. But soap, water, pulling weeds, cleaning garbage matters. And so when you gave me that example in Dallas, my first comment would be, how do we educate people that if you want big real estate investors to come, if you want banks to come, if you want municipalities to come and invest in your community by rehabbing the old houses or rehabbing the commercial buildings, what signal are you sending them mm -hmm. that gives them the indication or them the confidence that they're not going to have to carry the water themselves. Right. right. Yeah, I feel like people still need direction for that. Like that town in Texas, they needed to hear from somebody that the curb need to be painted. You know, for a lot of those people who probably grew up there, they probably thought, you don't paint curbs or, the, you know, the, paint, the curb is always... It's supposed you know, to be like that. It's supposed to be like that or you don't pull weeds. But they needed to hear somebody tell them, this needs to happen. And I would love to see pictures of that town so we could actually I will, use it. I will get, I will get that. We probably could just Google them. There, yeah. there, there'll be a test up Kansas. there. Kansas. Yeah. That's awesome. The, the thing about that is, is it all comes down to that education you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Who's willing to put the time? Who's willing to put the energy? And so we circle back to your original question. Why do I do what I do? Mm -hmm. Because if I can use the media platform to disseminate that story and teach that lesson and one person hears it and they go paint their curb, mm -hmm. the likelihood of them getting somebody like you to give them $25,000 first mortgage or second mortgage on their property yeah. to improve it at a 6% interest rate, it's not going to be market. It's going to be slightly above because the risk is there. Mm -hmm. And give them a clear payment terms back and how it all works and teach them, the world would change. You know, I, uh, since we've been talking all day today, I, I keep hearing about how generous you are. You don't tell me how generous you are, but you tell me that you went to this town, you <laughs> yeah. use your own resources, you buy buildings, and you yeah. give it back to the town. Do you think you would have the same sort of attitude and you would be so ready to give back buildings if you had children? I think I would probably do it more. I think I would probably do it even more. Uh, I... Uh, I have a regret that I don't have kids. It's a regret for sure. It's not something that I could change now. Um, and I think about the 14,000 people that work in my business mm -hmm. as my children. Mm -hmm. They always get a little like, they always like, sort of like, when I say that to them, but I tell them that I'm, I'm responsible for you. 
I think if I had children, I would want them the under, to understand the value of, of altruistic capitalism. Not conscious capitalism, mm -hmm. but altruistic capitalism. I'm a capitalist. I like to make money. I like to make a lot of money. And I don't apologize for it. Um, but I also like to take that money and I like to weaponize other people who don't necessarily have the same resources. Uh, because both you and I are sitting here today because somebody gave us an opportunity. Somebody opened up a door when they probably shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Somebody gave us an education when they didn't need to. And so that's really my motivation. And if I had kids, I would want them to understand that. And I would probably say to them, you probably think that this is all going to be yours, yeah. right? It's not. You're going to get this much. And we're going to, as a family, give the rest away because we just borrowed the money from the economy. That's how I think about wealth. I, I just am the holder of this currency for right now. Mm -hmm. And now I decided that instead of giving it to one person, I want to give it to 5,000 people. Right. If you go onto my social today, and I don't know if you're on Twitter, but I use Twitter as a tool. I stay away from bad news. I stay away from politics. I stay away from self-promotion of businesses that I have investments in. And I use it to give gifts away. Like this morning, I gave away a $25,000 car. Mm -hmm. I do that because I want to leave this earth being seen as somebody who used his gifts from God and talents to accumulate wealth and used his big mouth and his personality to disseminate the wealth that I accumulated. Yeah. And have fun doing it. Yeah, I mean, It makes people happy. It, it, it does make you feel good, though, doesn't it? When you give something away, you make somebody's life uh, better. Yes, when they do something good with it. Um, people, you know, I see you, you know, in your talks and stuff, you always say to update your network and be around like-minded people, be with people who are better than you, so, you know, or people you want to emulate. Uh, but it, that's not so easy to do. You know, if, like, if you're just starting out and you want to hang out with the guys who are doing the big real estate deals or doing the, you know, doing the kind of businesses that you want to do, it's not easy to just, like how do you recommend for people to just update their network of uh, people they hang out with? Well, I don't want them to hang out. I want them to work. Mm -hmm. We'll start with that. Uh, there's different ways that you can network with people, right? You can become a student of them and be in their network and learn and create connections inside. And you may never get to that one man or woman that you aspire to meet. Mm -hmm. But you may get to the community of people that are like-minded, that follow that person. For example, if I wanted to get heavily invested into real estate and say take a couple hundred million dollars and really invested in a plethora of real estate, and this is the honest to God truth, and this is a compliment, I hope, I would start to dig myself deeper into the real deal community. Mm -hmm. I would study who people are writing about. I would see who people, what people were commenting. I would study the uh, um, events that you put on and what speakers you bring there. And I would start to um, um, familiarize myself with people. And I would understand that there's a pecking order. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's how there's like this pecking order. And I would start from the bottom and I would understand who the active users were and I would try to communicate with them. And then I would work my way up trying to glean information and yeah. glean expertise, hoping that at some point I would be able to navigate myself to you. Right. Literally. Yeah. To you. It's a little ironic that I'm sitting with you today because I became a fan not knowing you, not knowing your background, but being fascinated by the content you disseminate. So if I wanted to get into real estate, I could immerse myself in your community and potentially, if I was lucky, I may never get to meet you, but I could come to your event. Yeah. Right? In Miami or wherever you have it. I could go to your website every day. We'd I love to you for you to come to our event and be, put you on stage. That's okay. <laughs> I would come, but 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 for the average student of the game, how do they get to where right. you are? And you have to immerse yourself. I probably, if I lost everything today, I would either sell cars or sell real estate. Yeah. Those are the two things that I would do. And I would probably walk into an office, a well-known office, and I would say, can I intern? Can I shadow? You don't have to pay me. Can I get you coffee? Can I go open the door? Can I, I would just, can I, can I, can I? Right. And I think a lot of young people today think that you go from like here to here and they forgot all the shit in between. <laughs> 
Um, and real estate is one of those things that there is no in between. Right. From my expectations, right? Is that right? Yeah. It's like work. Just, you just work and you get the right deal. And there's, you know, a little bit there's of luck. no guarantees. There's a little bit of luck. Sure. There's, um, you know, there's a, especially when people get to a certain level, they hit a certain amount of success and they feel like they could sort of pull back. They don't have to go to the conferences. They don't have to educate anymore because business is easy. Money is coming in. And I see that happen with so many people. And I literally see it before my eyes where I see, you know, a business or a company just sort of deteriorate because, they, you know, the sort of the people who are running it, they're like, I, I don't need this. My business is great. Why do I need to go to a conference? Why do I need to connect with this person? Do you, do you see that a lot? What, what's your remedy for that? I do. I want to break it up into two parts. First of all, um, we should be going to conferences and we should be going to symposiums and we should be attending Zoom calls and all those things because nobody can be too educated mm -hmm. and nobody can know too much. So that, that would be my first thing. And trends change so much. On the finance side, trends change. Uh, the way that uh, municipalities look at real estate changes. There's so many different moving parts and pieces that to think that you've arrived, you're going to be fine. You're going to be Circuit City. You're going to be out of business. Right. Uh, the parable that I'll tell you, which is actually a true parable, is I was um, on a photo shoot one day, um, maybe halfway through making the profit. So maybe four or five years in. And my phone rang. And uh, it said JP Morgan on it. And um, um, I thought it was my banker calling me like I had a problem with my checking account or there was some issue. Like, I, right. you know, you see something from the bank, you're like, oh shit, what's the problem? And, um, and I shouldn't have told you it was JP Morgan, but my phone rings and uh, this guy's on the other side of the phone and he says, Marcus? Is it, yes. Uh, hi, uh, I'd like to just talk to you for a few minutes. Is this a good time? I said, well, it's not, it's not a great time, but I always answer my phone. Yeah. I don't screen my calls. I always answer. And uh, he says, well, I'd like to just tell you that I'm really, really proud of, of the show that you make. My family and I really enjoy it. And we learn a lot every week. Even I learn something. Yeah. Y yes, sir. Thank you so much. It was, you know, thank you so much for calling. I'm, I'm really grateful. Yeah. I, I didn't know what else to Did, say. Who was the guy? So he says, I would like to see if we could set up a time for you and I to meet. I said, okay. I said, you know, I, 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 I typically don't. You know, don't, I'm really kind of busy. I'm running my business. And he said, well, I, I think it would be, be good for us. I think we could do a lot of business together. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, sir, would it be possible for, you, for me to call you back? Because yeah. I said, I have some folks waiting. I answered my phone. I probably shouldn't have. He said, sure. I said, would you like my name and number? And I said, yes, I'd like your name and number. He said, my first name is Jamie. <laughs> And my last name is Diamond. Not Diamond like the diamonds. Right. And I said, no, seriously. <laughs> Who is this? Right. And he said, no, I'm serious. And I said, well, how'd you get my phone number? And he said, well, I'm the chairman of the world's largest <laughs> bank. I go, of course I got your right. phone number. He said, I'd like you to come to my office. And I hung up the phone. And the thing that I took away from that call, which is a little like your conference question, is that a gentleman that I admire whether you like him or not, is a brilliant guy. The chairman of the world's largest bank is saying that something that you're doing, he's learning from. Yeah. He doesn't need to learn from me. And so if you think that you've learned or you don't need conferences or you don't need to check in on a website every day or you don't read, need to read something in the magazine every single day, well, Jamie Dimon thought it was a pretty yeah, good right. idea. So I think it's a pretty good and idea. And you guys connected. We did and I became um, a real big advocate for the same things that you and I talked about, which is I became an advocate for small business for them. Mm -hmm. And it was all about educating small business owners how to pay a loan back, mm -hmm. not how to borrow. Yeah. He was frustrated that his, his staff was doing a great job of creating loans, but that the business owners didn't understand the important part of getting a loan, yeah. which is paying it back <laughs> and building credit and building relationships and building credibility. And so we worked uh, for about six years on that program and uh, uh, he helped me take my company public as part of that whole relationship. That's incredible. And so it's, How, what, what uh, year was that? 2016, we took the company public and him and I started working together in 2014. That's incredible. Yeah. So relationships yeah. matter. This, um, what do you have to say about the great, like you saw the great resignation. That was like the first time in the history of 
our generation that we saw anything like that. What did you think about that when that was happening? I mean, you're you're seeing small businesses that you know, you saw the labor market just go absolutely berserk in every which direction. Like, what, what was your first thought when you saw that stuff? Well, I think to some degree, there's a little bit of misinformation out there um, that uh, some of our younger folks that wanted to be part of the great resignation were making these decisions, financial decisions, with not necessarily all the facts. Mm -hmm. And when the labor market got really tight and we couldn't find people to work at a restaurant or be a clerk at a store or wash our dog, or service our car, uh, we, I think a lot of people became emboldened to think that the, that, that there was, there's the balance of power had shifted, mm -hmm. that it was now the employees had dominance over the employer. I've never liked an environment where either party has dominance. Mm -hmm. I think there's a perfect balance between employee and employer. I don't think the government should be involved in regulating wages. I think that a good capitalist should recognize good talent and they should pay for it. I think over time, and particularly in the last four or five months, as the economy has started to tighten up again, the great resignation now looks like the great application, <laughs> where people are realizing that that avenue of creating uh, funds to survive, to pay their bills, yeah. isn't there. We have a little bit of a problem in this country, and the young people will be mad at me for saying this, where I think we're starting to skip steps. Um, we believe that we should go from one point to the other. And the great resignation was largely driven around people wanting to do different things in their life. Mm -hmm. But you still have rent or a mortgage payment or a car payment. You still need to go to whatever your local grocery store is and you still need to, to pay your bills. Yeah. And this appetite to follow your passion is wonderful and I want people to do it. But maybe that's at 5.05 mm -hmm. or at six o'clock. And so I, I, I'm starting to sense that the great resignation is reversing itself a little bit. This idea that everybody can become a realtor and they're gonna be their own boss and they're gonna call their own shots and they're gonna come and go as they please. And that's part of like, I'm now self-employed and I'm an entrepreneur is wonderful, but not in a real estate market that's doing the opposite. Right. So these tides change. Um, I do like the fact that people are starting to find the value in pursuing things that make them happy. Mm -hmm but you still have to pay your bills. Yeah, 100%. There is this, um, uh, you, you deal with a lot of different management styles, you know, and you've worked with a lot of different types of companies and you have your own major company that you uh, work with. What are, the, what are some of the best management styles that you envy, that, uh, that you can't necessarily learn in school that are sort of innate? Well, I think the, the first one um, is uh, self-deprecation. It's something that I talk about all the time and it doesn't have to be a negative thing, but you know, when we, when we go into a meeting with our boss or we're trying to accelerate our position in our company, the worst thing that we can do as employees is be the know-it-all in the room. And if we know that as the manager, we should take some of our own advice. Mm -hmm. And when we go into a staff meeting and I'll include you and I in the same thing, we sometimes forget that we don't have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. For me, the greatest leadership skill of an owner or a manager is one where they're willing to poke fun at themselves. They're willing to acknowledge what they don't know. They're willing to acknowledge that the people in the room are there to fill in their own deficiencies, meaning I bring people in my room because I have a ton of deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it like a puzzle, we're one piece of that puzzle. And we may be the biggest piece, we could be the corner, we may be the most important piece in our own mind, but the puzzle is in a picture without everybody there. Mm -hmm. And having, having bosses understand that <clears throat> you can still set the tempo, you can still set the pace, you can still make the rules, all the things that make you pound on your chest, right. you can still do it. But recognizing your deficiencies and acknowledging them publicly to your staff won't make them think you're weak they'll make them rally around you. Right. Yeah, that's it's good. been your secret to success. I mean, the best part is like, you know, I had a great idea 20 years ago and I've been able to surround myself with people who are smarter than me. So, the, you know, it, that, that's been the greatest advantage of being able to hire people who are better than you at, you know, you think of something and you're like, hey, we should do this. And hiring people who are just, who know it, who know it better than you, who've done it before. Yep. That's been the greatest advantage. I think the second thing is transparency. Mm -hmm. 
I think a lot of bosses believe that the information that they uh, disseminate to their team needs to be good information all the time. Mm -hmm. It always needs to be that everything is wonderful and everything is beautiful. And if I was running a big real estate company today, I would probably sit down with my team and talk to them about what belt tightening they need to do in their own lives mm -hmm. and what potentially is about to happen. And I'm not trying to bring darkness in a very well lit room, but I'm trying to be realistic that as a boss, I feel responsible like a shepherd in a field for the people that are with me that are, that are relying on my business judgment. I feel like I have to give them the bad news too. Mm -hmm. We may have to close some things. Mm -hmm. We may, our revenue could be down 40%. Our commissions could be compromised because in this year we were dealing with record high prices and the commissions were hot and people would pay us anything. And now we're dealing in a different environment. I think the reality of that, even the simplest, newest level employee will appreciate the education and the transparency. Bosses don't want to appear weak. It's okay to somebody like, I'm worried. Mm -hmm. I tell my folks like, I'm worried. Yeah. What are you worried about? I'm worried that we're not prepared. What are we not prepared for? We're not prepared for what's about to happen. The market's going to drop by 30%. Consumers are not going to show up at the same pace. They're going to take longer. Our margins are going to get compressed. These things are going to happen. So we need to start to make plans mm -hmm. like we plan for a hurricane. Yeah. It's no different. And that's, that's the other thing. I want that transparency and I want that self-deprecation. Uh, you, again, you deal with a lot of businesses, partnerships that absolutely should never happen, that don't work. Usually the preview to the movie um, ends up being the actual movie. <laughs> and when you sense that people have a history of doing bad things or a history of not following through, or a history of always looking for the angle, why would you believe that in this one instance, right. they're going to be different? I'll give you a story that, uh, that may resonate a little, and I'll, I'll try to connect the dots. Um, I've been married twice. I'm happily married today, and I'm still friends with my first wife. My mother was alive when I got divorced the first time, and I called her up and I said, I got married too young. Uh, it's not going to work out. And my mother said to me, I'm going to give you advice in life that I want you to also apply in business. The next person that you marry or the next person that you partner with in life or in business is going to pay very close attention to how you exited your last deal. Mm -hmm. And how you handle that is going to give them a roadmap for how you're going to treat them. Mm -hmm. I, would, I was invested in a business um, that uh, probably should have went bankrupt uh, recently, a small business, um, probably should have went bankrupt. And uh, we had way too many leases. We grew too fast. I take responsibility for allowing them to do it and for promoting the idea of it. When the, the, the managing partner of that business said to me, I don't want to keep taking money from you. We can just file bankruptcy and we can clean it all up in a day and, and, and you won't have to put as much money in going forward. Right. And I said to him, um, you're right. It would probably cost me $10 million less to do that. But I'm going to have to deal with the collateral damage and the reputational damage that's going to come with it. Mm -hmm. And it's not the BK word that bothers me. It's, oh, I'm not going to pay that landlord they're going to take it. And I'm not going to do this and they're going to take it. Right. And my theory has always been that if you get into business, you understand the risk associated with it. And while there are certain instances where people may have to file bankruptcy, and I, I can't judge people, I can only judge myself, I would rather continue to write checks and pay for my sins and pay for my mistakes and say to you, Mr. Landlord, I signed a personal guarantee because I believed in what I was doing and you didn't even ask me for it. Right. I'm going to pay you your rent because your family depends on it. I would like to negotiate some of it, but what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to just throw the red flag out or whatever the flag mm -hmm. is. Because I really believe that a partnership ultimately is based, the health of it is based on what you did before. Right. And if I cooked one person, just one out of thousands, 
that one person may know the person that I want to do my next deal with. And so for me, partnerships are all of, always about doing what you say you're going to do. If you make a mistake or you screw up or you make a bad decision on your way out, do the best you can to clean it up, pay for your sins and move on. It's uh, funny because we write stories about people who have stolen money and we are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars or have taken money from one project and put it towards another they weren't supposed to do. And they go bankrupt and they get sued as absolute tragedy and they rebuild themselves and they come back and people continue to invest with them. I mean, that's never truer than with New York City real estate titans. Yeah. You'd like your Harry Macklows of the world who've gone bankrupt and they've come back and people continue to invest with them. I just don't understand the logic there. But uh, it exists. And some of them are around today who are doing their next deal with, yeah. you know. In fairness, right, there are certain circumstances that may put people into bankruptcy that are outside of their control. Mm. A lender could potentially cause that right through a foreclosure action. Uh, something like COVID could somehow cause that. The question is, when that person went bankrupt, what were the real facts and what were the real circumstances? Are they still enjoying a fat cat life? while they cook, their, they cook everybody else, their investors and their lenders, or are they also going through the same peril? Yeah. And I look at that lens differently, and I think there's a lot of people who have unfortunately had to file bankruptcy for a variety of reasons who wouldn't have chosen to do that, who have rebuilt themselves. I would reinvest in that person. Yeah. But if you're with your big yacht over by the port, that's what Maybach, I'm talking about, yeah. That, that, that's, yeah. But it continues, and we see it. I mean, there's examples of it. I can send you articles of it. But... Um, Marcus, thank you so much. You got it. This was, it was awesome. awesome.